Lord Lansdowne, about the very object of the war itself. There were continuing shipping losses, still in excess of new building. There were food shortages and a frightening influenza epidemic. There was a ferocious agitation against enemy aliens in Britain. A petition with one and a quarter million signatures demanded the internment of every alien forthwith. The largest mass meeting in Trafalgar Square since the outbreak of war urged the same thing. This rage against aliens displayed the hysterical element in Britain's will to victory. A letter to the Times said, At last the view of Germany as she really is, is dawning on the British people. They are beginning to think that with a nation so polluted and polluting, whose ideals are so false and whose human feeling is so dead, no people acknowledging the morals of Christianity or even of civilization ought, as it values its own soul, to have truck or dealing or even speech. On August the 8th, the London Times reported an article in the Frankfurter Zeitung. There will be little sense in yielding to illusions about what is before us. We shall have to go on fighting during the winter and doubtless during next summer also. And the troops which are crossing the ocean every day from America must feed the war, like fresh logs thrown upon a dying fire. And this will not make the fighting easy. On this day, August the 8th, fresh logs were indeed thrown on the fire. On July the 17th, the eve of Foch's counterstroke on the Marne, the British Commander-in-Chief, Sir Douglas Haig, had suggested to him a joint French and British attack to relieve the important rail centre of Amiens. This proposal, said Foch, was perfectly in harmony with my way of looking at the matter. On July the 20th, he wrote to Haig, Having reached the point where we now are, it is indispensable to seize the enemy and attack him wherever we can do so to our own advantage. The combined attack should be carried out at once. Haig had been preparing this stroke for over two months. He entrusted it to General Rawlinson's 4th Army. The whole British Army was now a very different force from the one which emerged from the great costly defensive battles of March and April. Haig recognized the transformation. Two months of comparative quiet worked a great change in the condition of the British armies. The drafts sent out from England had been largely absorbed. Many of the reinforcements from other fronts had arrived. And the number of our effective infantry divisions had risen from 45 to 52. In artillery, we were stronger than we had ever been. The British army was ready to take the offensive. By 1918, British war production was truly organized on the scale of these tremendous needs. In March and April, under the German hammer blows, the British Army lost over a thousand guns and vast quantities of war material. British production was able to replace these losses before the same battles were over. At the end of April, the King addressed a message to the munitions workers. The King has learned from the military authorities that practically all the losses and expenditure of munitions during the battle have already been made good without any undue depletion of normal reserves. Out of the resources which have been held in readiness and by the additional effort which have been made. There are now actually more serviceable guns, machine guns and aeroplanes with the British armies in the field than there were on the eve of the German attack. Thus fortified, Haig completed his preparations to counter-attack. But, as 1916 and 1917 had shown, something more was needed than filled ranks and vast stocks of war material. Secrecy. By every trick in the book, the British Fourth Army worked to achieve surprise. Every soldier had a notice pasted into his paybook. It said, Keep your mouth shut. The success of any operation we carry out depends chiefly on surprise. Do not talk. When you know that your unit is making preparations for an attack, don't talk about them to men in other units or to strangers. And keep your mouth shut, especially in public places. 
Do not be inquisitive about what other units are doing. If you hear or see anything, keep it to yourself. The success of the operations and the lives of your comrades depend on your silence. On July the 28th, Foch placed the first French army under Haig's command for the forthcoming battle. This was kept secret. Haig wrote to the French commander, to tell him that I would not call at his headquarters until operations had started, in order not to excite suspicion. Behind the Australians was massed another formidable fighting unit, the Canadian Corps, nearly a hundred thousand strong. This too was kept secret. Behind them all, to exploit a success, the Cavalry Corps was brought in, with over 15,000 horses to hide on the empty Somme uplands. Over 2,000 guns were assembled, also in secrecy. And since this was 1918, and a different style of war, Rawlinson had under his command, silently gathered, some 800 aircraft and 534 tanks. Of all this, the German high command knew nothing. On August the 4th, Ludendorff composed an order of the day. I'm under the impression that in many quarters, the possibility of an enemy offensive is viewed with a certain degree of apprehension. There is nothing to justify this apprehension, provided our troops are vigilant and do their duty. The Battle of Amiens opened at 4.20 a.m. on August the 8th. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. O oh, guns, fall silent till the dead men hear above their heads the legions pressing on. O oh, flashing muzzles, pause, and let them see the coming dawn that streaks the sky afar. Then let your mighty chorus witness be to them and Caesar that we still make war. Tell them, O oh guns, that we have heard their call, that we have sworn and will not turn aside, that we will onward till we win or fall, that we will keep the faith for which they died. Here you are, 8th of August. 400 tanks along the Amiens front. Is there a man alive of us who forgets? What a day. 400 tanks in line of battle. Good going, firm ground. The air grows electric. Two minutes to go. Watch his tick, heart's beat. One minute to go. Then the whole world upheaves. No words can describe it. Just the whole world heaves, rocks, tumbles, turns upside down, ricochets. We can see, hear, and feel nothing. The driver's on his seat, his hand on the clutch. Soon she's humming, sweet and low. I depress the pedal and she roars magnificently, like the great man-eater she is. She gives a lurch and a roll. The gunners spread their feet for balance, and we're off. was marvelous. Grass was just like you put in your front garden, just like a bit of Cumberland turf that was springing. You, you felt you were in for a joyride. 